Hello, everyone, to the next installation of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society webinar series. Today, we have Dr. Robert Engel from uh, Canadian Forces College, and he'll be talking about virtual war games that he has run this past year. Uh, as a reminder, please put your questions in the chat and feel free to discuss amongst yourself. This uh, webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel for those who have to duck out halfway or uh, miss parts of it. So. I hand it over to Robert, it's your show. Thanks very much, much Sebastian. Um, thank you everyone uh, for being here. I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to give this talk um, for, the, uh, for, for, for Georgetown. Um, I am a great admirer of everything that the Wargaming Society has done, um, and especially their social media presence. Uh, well done to, uh, to all of you who are watching this. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. I am an assistant professor at the Canadian Forces College, which is our senior staff college. Um, and we are, um, the, the talk today is about the program of, of virtual war games that we have uh, begun and, and have uh, created over the space of the last 18 months since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, joining me tonight, at least for the first part of my lecture is my two month old son, Montgomery. Um, he is uh, uh, unfortunately Unfortunately, the six o'clock timing for this talk meant that uh, my wife is busy putting our four-year-old to bed, um, so the two-month-old uh, still needs a little tender loving care. Um, he, he actually attends most of my lectures and seminars and uh, discussions at CFC, so he's used to daddy prattling on a little bit um, and uh, will probably be minimally disruptive. Um, it is possible I will be thrown up on, which I hope would be a first for the uh, GUWS um, seminar series, but uh, we'll see where the evening takes us. So um, uh, a quick, uh, uh, oh, um, is the, is the, Sebastian, is the screen share going still? Are we still yes. good with that? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm only faintly aware of what everyone else is seeing. Um, okay. Uh, in terms of structure, I want to, I want to give a little bit of background to begin with and then go through a, a kind of a blow by blow of, of, uh, of our pandemic reaction at Canadian Forces College, CFC. Um, a few problematic elements that uh, that I really want to flag uh, as as being some of the major challenges for war gaming um, at uh, at the college and possibly at professional military education institutes in general, and a few notes um, at the end for what we hope to do in the future. And following that, um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So I don't want to overburden you with PowerPoint slides packed with notes. Uh, there are a few of those. Um, I've tried to keep it fairly lively. This is meant to be a, a, a gentle introduction to the wargaming program at CFC. Um, there will not be a quiz. No, don't worry, Monty, there will not be. And there will not be a particularly dense PowerPoint, aside from some of the research note slides, um, which are there for interest if anyone, uh, if anyone wants uh, uh, some reference for it. Sorry, a bit of a fussy baby here too. So um, here's the bio I submitted for this talk, standard academic stuff, uh, books, articles, academic affiliation, the works. I've been at Canadian Forces College working in PME, professional military education for three years now. Uh, it's far and away the most rewarding work that I've ever done for any, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. It has become all the more rewarding now that war gaming has become uh, fairly, uh, fairly prominent in the uh, curriculum at the college. Um, what uh, may not be immediate, obviously, immediately obvious from looking at me is that I'm also a huge nerd, and a good many of the things that I'm going to talk about today stem from the unwritten part of my biography, uh, the thousands of hours of my ill-spent youth that were devoted to playing role-playing games, board games, war games, video games, and trying to puzzle out what makes them tick and how they could be better adapted for to uh, what I wanted them to do. So uh, here is the uh, a, a lovely photo of the uh, Armor Heights Officers Mess at Canadian Forces College. Uh, CFC represents actually two programs. We have uh, our Joint Command and Staff Program, which is our um, which is uh, uh, the the program for majors um, and uh, lieutenant commanders um, who are uh, who are looking uh, uh, looking looking to be upward mo upwardly mobile. And then we have our senior staff uh, our senior staff program, um, the National Security Program 
program, which is for uh, colonels who have a prospect of going on to become uh, general officers or flag officers. Most of my teaching and all, virtually all of what I'm going to be talking about today um, is, uh, is concerning the Joint Command and Staff Program, so the junior of the two programs. Um, there are some, I just had a discussion this morning, I think Rebecca Jensen, uh, Dr. Re Rebecca Jensen is uh, in the audience today. Uh, she and I just had a discussion, um, this is a colleague of mine, about incorporating some gaming into the national security program as well. Um, but that's uh, something for a bit in the future. Most of what we've been doing is at uh, the, the JCSP level. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, wargaming applications. I, I've, I've, I'm a fan of Tom Mallett's delineation of the applications of wargaming. So I put it up here to show where we fall. Um, it draws some differentiation between focusing on wargaming for analysis and research and wargaming for training and education. And at CFC, we are... Oh, that was very rude. And at CFC, we're, we're, we're very much more on the training and education side of the equation. A lot of the professional war games uh, are on the analysis and research side um, as an adjunct to operational research or operational analysis. Our objective at CFC has, has very little to do with the outcomes and is more about the process and substituting war gaming for traditional seminars, threaded discussions, and the like. Uh, so this is where it started. This is the first and last live war game uh, I participated in back at uh, CFC in January of 2020 before the lockdowns. Myself and Lieutenant Colonel Scott Jenkinson of the Australian Army, who was the true powerhouse behind wargaming at CFC for a long time. Um, we fought out a game called Plan 1919 that simulated an, an alternate ending to the First World War. Um, this man could beat me eight ways from Friday in a fight, but put a major river barrier in front of him and he is absolutely helpless. Uh, but this was wargaming at CFC, uh, professors and directing staff playing in our spare time. And the reason for this was that getting anything inserted into curriculum is, is really quite difficult. Uh, without getting into detail, it was easier to kind of use calcified curriculum elements than to, to try new things. Uh, just before the pandemic, I tried to have some adjustments made to how we structured readings and was shot down because it wouldn't be fair unless we made such changes across all of the college's streams. And that was too big a conversation to have on anything less than about six months notice. Um, this isn't just like CFC. There are longstanding concerns about fairness and inclusion there. And I think these are problems faced by most academic academic and PME institutions rather than mine specifically. But change is hard across any of them. Uh, but then COVID came along early in 2020, as we all remember, and the Canadian Forces College as an organization discovered that its nimbleness and flexibility had to grow about 10 sizes in one day or else our program was doomed. So in mid-March of 2020, uh, just when everything went completely to pot in North America, I was in Arlington at a wargaming certification course through Moores uh, with uh, Ed McGrady and Peter Perla. After the last day of the workshop, which was that Friday, I ended up doing a midnight drive to get back to Canada when they started talking about slamming the border shut. Uh, I took a couple of weeks to self-isolate, watch the world burn uh, when I got back, and then got down to work. Uh, because like almost everyone else, we were caught off guard by how fast everything unfolded. We, we needed to go to ground right away. All of the students were sent home from the residential CFC campus and did not return. In fact, they still have not returned to this day. Um, our IT and library departments struggled to put all of the courses up online so that we could at least finish the 2019-2020 academic year. Everyone was frightened, worried, not sure how COVID was going to go, and we were suddenly all distance learning faculty entering into what we called emergency remote teaching mode. And it is in that spirit that Wargaming, I think, really came into its own at CFC. Uh, Rahm Emanuel's quote, uh, he, he said it for sure, sometimes it's attributed to Churchill, sort of became the faculty mantra at CFC and, and certainly my own personal slogan, because suddenly all institutional and bureaucratic inertia was removed at the college and everything needed to change all at once. And frankly, the change was going to be dominated by people who were willing to put in all of the work on short notice to make it happen. So I came back from the Moore's workshop in Arlington uh, with a bunch of ideas, wanting to try them out. I had a small section of the curriculum at CFC um, and had permission from the leadership to pursue a crazy idea. Uh, we didn't want, we didn't have to replace all of our seminars. Maybe we didn't have to replace all of our seminars with, with threaded discussions. Maybe we didn't have to have the academic year end with a fizzle. Maybe we could put something memorable, effective, and fun together for our students to help them complete their learning objectives at CFC, despite all the terror and disruption of the early part of the pandemic. 
And th that's how CFC was uh, introduced to virtual wargaming. Um, I wanted to replace some of the uh, some of the uh, admittedly not great modules of our advanced joint warfighting stream program with large scale war, war games conducted entirely virtually uh, that still fit the existing learning objectives and outcomes that we had established for the stream. So it was early 2020 when we got this approved by the leadership and delivery for the emergency remote teaching courses in my stream began in the first week of May. I, I don't remember much about the month in between. I, I worked a lot. Um, a lot of people were working a lot. It would have been easier and probably smarter to use a, a prefabbed war game, but I didn't know if I was ever going to get an opportunity to showcase something on my own design again. So um, I poured everything I had into developing an idea that I had from the Arlington Moores workshop. And somehow it all came together and worked. And 18 months later, we have uh, quite a robust program of virtual wargaming lined up at CFC uh, with plans for more, because the college has really embraced the idea that A, this is something that works really well for education and training, and B, this is something that we can do regardless of the pandemic. Uh, CFC is still under provincial public health orders right now, which means that we cannot bring the full cohort of 120 Joint Command and Staff Program students into the building at the same time. We do not have sufficient square footage to physically distance. And who knows what's going to happen in the future with variants of COVID and whether we'll get to start this whole delightful cycle all over again. So the more time and effort we invest in this now, the better we can do with creating a program that is useful no matter the circumstances. So what exactly were the college's wargaming requirements? Well, there, there was never a, a formal statement of needs or anything because this was all being done on the fly in the midst of the emergency. Um, in many ways, it was the parameters of the emergency itself that defined what our needs were. I note that this was uh, for the early pandemic as the needs of wargaming have, uh, at the college have changed since then. Um, all of these points had a significant influence on what needed to be designed. Uh, first of all, mass war games. We, we needed to be able to meaningfully involve either the uh, number of, of students in a particular specialist course stream, which is about 30 to 40, or the entire cohort of the JCSP program, 120. We also had to cope with limited facilitation resources. We could train the directing staff to a point, but we couldn't get them to run their own war games for their own syndicates necessarily. And there was neither time nor money to bring in a lot of outside help. Uh, second, it had to be delivered via existing pre-approved college software platforms because these games were going to be played primarily on the college-issued computers that the students had taken home to ensure a uniform access experience um, once, once we'd all dispersed and gone to ground. More on this in a minute. It meant ruling out Steam altogether and going through a screening process with IT if we wanted any kind of different uh, software platforms. Um, third, needs to be aligned with existing curriculum learning objectives. Um, to achieve full utility, uh, that makes it harder to use pre-existing tabletop games. They would have to be very on point to meet the specific curriculum demands. And while I've done a lot of games, I, I didn't know of any that were going to fit that niche perfectly. Um, so that pretty much demanded a custom job that was going to, going to be required. Um, uh, a fourth, relatively low bandwidth, and this was a very specific CFC problem in the early months of the pandemic. Our IT department was not resourced and did not have the infrastructure to do what we were asking it to do, which was take the entire program online at the drop of a hat. We had originally tried to pre-record all lectures across the program for robustness in case the pandemic got really bad and we had a lot of people getting sick. Um, that wasn't so much the problem, but the, the bandwidth was so awful that you could literally not stream the videos that were being made. We had to go to live synchronous Zoom lectures. Uh, so effectively, any material running off of the college's servers had to be tiny, maybe two megabytes or less, or else the entire thing was going to collapse around its own ears. Um, they have since received a significant infrastructure upgrade and again, I don't blame the college for this. So this was, uh, uh, this was a, uh, everyone did a magnificent job with the resources we had at our, at our disposal. Um, but unfortunately, those resources at the start were fairly meager. Um, they've received a significant upgrade, uh, but that was a hard limit imposed on what we could run. And finally, we wanted to privilege asynchronous play. Um, by that, I mean that this wasn't a case of everyone sitting down for a couple of hours around a game board and just playing the game. We had students scattered across all of Canada's time zones, uh, most of them with kids at home because of the early lockdowns, and everyone was losing their minds. If we wanted a robust game, we were going to have to let the team self-organize to best suit themselves. 
So what we really needed was something like a play by mail game of chess or diplomacy, where you submit the orders um, at a specific time, in our case, once or twice a day. Uh, but there's no requirement for the teams to be synchronously connected with one another at any particular time, except for debriefing at the beginning and the deb debriefing at the end. So these myriad requirements meant that many of the traditional tools for delivering online war games weren't going to work. Uh, Tabletop Simulator, Vassal, and Foundry are the ones that I've, I've used in the past. We face an uphill battle in getting Steam approved for security purposes on CFC devices by our IT department. Uh, Vassal and Foundry are uh, somewhat better options. Um, for now, these are the only tools, these that I'm showing on the screen now are the only tools that we've used to deliver these war games, um, none of which have had any automated or automatic components to them. They are effectively giant board games, which White Cell runs by hand in PowerPoint. Uh, orders and results are posted to Moodle, our college's uh, learning software, and Zoom has been the primary platform for synchronous meetings, though this has been recently replaced by uh, Microsoft Teams at the college, which is notably inferior for the purposes of running games. Teams does, however, have a beautiful level of integration with other software or my other Microsoft software platforms that really help facilitate white cell coordination. So I don't dismiss it altogether. Um, the maps and hexagon grids were done with the uh, GIMP image editor. Uh, all of the icons, meeples, and what have you were put together very pleasantly in PowerPoint. So I, I want to run through some of the exercises that we did as, as an alternate way to develop ideas surrounding uh, the study of targeting in our uh, in our advanced warfighting stream, and as a way to make up for some of the, the physical closeness we lost by going online. Um, we developed and built Exercise Gossamer, which was a virtually delivered team-based war game to substitute for threaded discussions and online seminars. And the aim of this war game was to introduce key concepts and theory relevant to targeting and to examine restraints on targeting targeting, targeting and irregular warfare, and targeting in coalitions. Uh, the idea in an abstract, ideally in an abstract, fast, and playable way. It was not intended to be a recreation of the targeting cycle or to be a formal training in targeting. That's, that's not what CFC does. Um, the Canadian Forces has a separate school for that. But this was rather to draw out and represent some of the challenges of modern targeting and to create a game that represented the complexity of targeting and to, to spark discussion and reflection among its uh, participants the same way that a seminar on the topic would. This was heavily based heavily upon an idea that myself and a fellow Canadian, uh, Colonel Fred Moore of the Canadian Joint Warfare Center, had been kicking around at the Moore's workshop where we met in March. Uh, four CFC stream syndicates were split into two, creating eight separate teams, all of which played one war game supported by syndicate academics and directing staff and overseen by a white cell. The teams portrayed two sides in the completely fictional NATO member state of Baltica, which faced growing unrest and an insurgency backed by a hostile neighboring state, uh, the Federation. Teams would either play field forces with units on the map or would be command teams representing a high level targeting guidance and policy. Uh, teams coordinated among themselves and used online platforms uh, like Zoom and Slack. Uh, orders and results were posted to Moodle site twice a day for the one week that the module ran. Um, and uh, if for, for the purposes of the scenario, the NATO enhanced forward presence mission in Baltica was being led by Canada, which meant that Canada controlled the field force and had a command team of its own. So the bump that I hit with Exercise Gossamer that almost derailed uh, the whole thing uh, was uh, when about a week and a half before launch, I got a message from our the college's director of programs ask, asking who authorized a Baltic scenario. Uh, I did not know this at the time, but unlike the United States, Canada never uses real world country names as adversary forces in its war games. Uh, the US does this because it's a form of high level signaling. Uh, so I'm told I'm just getting the Canadian perspective on this. But Canada, by uh, very explicit policy, does not. So our games always involve evil Fantasians or the Redlanders or what have you. Um, it was awkward for me. I had set the whole thing up in Latvia, obviously. Fortunately, the powers that be were, were satisfied with some simple name changes and fictionalization. Latvia became the fictional country of Baltica with all the city names changed. Uh, thank God for the GIMP image editor and its meticulous tracking of layers in an image. Uh, the Russians became the Federation, which I generally liked better than calling them the Fantasians. Uh, but yes, I almost torpedoed my own game before it started through ignorance of my audience. Uh, thanks to the general benevolence of the leadership at the college, this turned out to be a very cheap lesson for me rather than a very costly one. And the game continued with these minor adjustments in place. 
Conflict within the game was resolved via the use of uh, the handy combat results table um, rolled behind the scenes by the white cell with the results then posted. Uh, this uses a, a pretty simple force ratio calculation with, with column adjustments and weights. Um, if you're familiar with wargaming, you've seen you've seen a hundred like these before. Um, but we use this for both kinetic and non-kinetic opposed actions. Uh, I've since changed that up so that kinetic and non-kinetic will have different tables. But at the time, I was going for something easy, if not elegant, and we uh, and having all actions rolled on the same CRT was definitely part of that. Now, the game was set up to allow entirely non-kinetic information operations, uh, irregular warfare, full-on conventional warfighting, the deployment of nuclear weapons, um, hybrid combinations at the player's discretion. The red teams, the Federation and the insurgents that they were supporting, were under orders to provoke some kind of conflict, but how they went about that was up to them. The way to win the game, however, was primarily non-kinetic. Each command team had a condition track representing public opinion. Non-kinetic operations directly targeted this condition track for erosion, as could an array of in-game events. If one side reached collapse on their, on their condition track, then public opinion or regime stability deteriorated and they withdrew from the conflict and the game ended. The intention behind Gossamer was to combine a structured war game rule set with a free play approach and a codified system for order submission that, that built reflection into the process of constructing the orders. Uh, the teams would submit their orders once every 24 hours with staggered turn times so the white cell could process and post results and so that the directing staff who were overseeing their syndicates would be able to spark conversations and discussions and connect it to some of the higher learning objectives and readings that were being done for the course. Um, and here's uh, a list of some of the game events that uh, affected the, the, uh, the, the condition tracks. Um, in, in practice, there were many different ways to try to achieve the goal of eliminating another team's condition track from the game. The outcome was a uh, complete surprise for everybody, uh, especially White Cell. The red team has figured out where the center of gravity was, allied public opinion. The NATO field forces engaged the insurgents directly and without authorization and created a political crisis of their own. The Federation imaginatively added to their problems with a series of info warfare and posturing moves that collapsed the Canadian government and forced their withdrawal from Baltica. Uh, Red did a superb job of placing coalition forces in a position where they had to respond in a way that was unfavorable to their own interests, no matter which action they pursued. So in defiance of student expectations that Blue could not possibly lose and would not be allowed to lose, um, Blue got its ass comprehensively kicked by Red. The NATO field forces unauthorized attack on the insurgents was termed by the student who was in charge of it, um, the Leroy Jenkins maneuver, and was born out of the frustration with the lack of communication and direction from the command team. They unilaterally chose to take aggressive action in the absence of direction, and this was afterwards exploited by the enemy team to win the game convincingly. The NATO field force team um, responsible for this got full marks, by the way. Winning or losing the game was a whole lot less important than discussing the why of it. And they gave us lots to talk about and reasoned defenses of what they did. Our second game on the advanced warfighting course was another one um, of my design called Exercise Runtime. And this was, this was the same basic execution and scenario as Exercise Gossamer, except that it included some rules adjustments and tweaks, uh, some additional capabilities, um, and one new big layer of rules. It was a full reset of the game, and we swapped things around so that blue was playing red, red was playing blue, and the previous command teams were now playing field forces. Um, so we had a whole new slate of personalities in charge of the action. But the focus for runtime was very explicitly on, um, on uh, cyber capabilities. And runtime took the place of seminars and threaded discussions on cyber operations. So the new layer of rules we built in were designed to simulate the effects, uh, though not the details, of major cyber operations in support of warfighting at an unclassified level. The cyber rules were designed by myself and by then Major Lauren Banks, uh, a more recently Lieutenant Colonel, um, who was then a student on our JCSP course and is now a Lieutenant Colonel and Head of uh, Cyber Operations on the Joint Strategic Staff. The crux of it was that every unit in the game now had a connectivity score. Uh, the higher the score, the higher their level of technological sophistication and networking was, but the more potentially vulnerable it was too, and the more zero-day vulnerabilities it would contain that enemies could potentially find and exploit. Uh, 
Um, we simulated cyber intelligence, network hygiene, uh, cyber weapons, and we thought it was a pretty good balance between the uh, between the, the 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 poles of technological sophistication and the increased amount of vulnerability that comes with all of that sophistication. The more complex rules worked here because we'd already had a chance to get the basics of the game down and exercise Gossamer the previous week. So everyone knew they came into this one knowing how to play the basic game. The cyber rules were a curveball, but were ultimately taken in stride. In a way, runtime was a bit disappointing because we didn't get to explore these cyber dimensions of the conflict to the extent that I wanted to. The personalities in charge of Red decided that they were going to go full kinetic and initiated uh, a straight up conventional invasion of Baltica almost immediately into the game. Um, and so the game became about the tanks rolling rather than about uh, the DDoS attacks. The cyber element did play a role, and some valuable lessons were definitely learned about the place of cyber in a warfighting context, but the new rules didn't take center stage. That said, what we saw of the rules worked really well, and so I have been determined to chase down and capture the perfect vessel for deploying them at the college ever since. Um, the design here, as I said, began from scratch in April of 2020 for a May 2020 delivery, so it was still pretty rough. Um, we didn't have any time to automate anything. Um, the, I, I have to say uh, that these two exercises worked really, really well. Um, the student feedback and investment was, was uh, tremendous. None of the students wanted their year at CFC to end on threaded discussions, which are typically a fairly low note. Um, so the buy-in was almost complete. Uh, the directing staff had to banish them from their, from their Zoom chat rooms um, where they were working out their plans each day to go have some dinner. I had got one um, almost comically distressed phone call from a, from a directing staff who was uh, marveling at how much time his syndicate was putting in, but was also uh, rather worried about it too and wanted to know if I could make them stop. Um, I didn't have a good answer for him, unfortunately. Uh, both myself and uh, Scott Jenkinson um, uh, received uh, received a commendation for uh, for our work on the war gaming um, and putting this together. Um, I took that as a blessing to get more ambitious with what we could deliver as part of the program the next year. After the success of Gossamer and Runtime, the college leadership decided that virtual war gaming was a uh, must have for the uh, forthcoming 2020-21 academic year as well. We had hoped at the beginning of the year that we might be able to get back to some in-person learning at some point. As it turned out, that proved to be impossible and that class never met in person. Uh, so the virtual war gaming uh, was uh, a major curricular element whose value increased substantially in the absence of any residential uh, educational programs. Um, it expanded significantly to include not just the exercises on the advanced joint warfighting stream, um, which is uh, taken by a little more than one third of the cohort each year, but to the entire JCSP cohort as a whole. Uh, the first of these exercises is called Jointex. It uh, rose because of a long-standing dissatisfaction with how joint operations had been taught at CFC. Uh, component and environmental capabilities have been, been taught very well and usefully for a long time, but then students have traditionally been tossed directly into learning the operational planning process with no intermediary step about how to think about jointness and joint operations. Um, it's been a problem that the military side of the shop has identified for some years now. And this past year, uh, we decided that a good corrective would be a joint operations war game or, or something like a war game. Um, if you're not familiar with it, Operation Husky was the invasion of Sicily, uh, the island off the toe of the Italian boot, in July of 1943. It was one of the most important and uh, most underappreciated military events of the Second World War. It marked the beginning of the final phase of the war, the return of the Western Allies to continental Europe. It was and still is the largest single day amphibious landing ever undertaken um, with, uh, I believe, seven divisions uh, landing in tandem. It was one of the most complex and successful joint combined and coalition operations ever, ever attempted. It was also a case study in component bickering, lack of synchronization, needless complication, uh, and clashes of personalities and national objectives. So I therefore viewed Husky as the ideal example to use when thinking about joint operations, particularly as a subject uh, for an exercise. There are a lot of ways to approach the problem of how to attack Sicily and the solution that was arrived at in the actual historical example is not really cited by anyone as being the correct way. So we wanted this to be a planning exercise rather than a tactical war game. Uh, one where the opponents were the other teams representing different components on the Allied side. And their challenge was to develop a cohesive joint plan for the invasion of Sicily, rather than uh, just planning a combined operation separate from one another. 
all teams shared the same primary objective as handed down by the general officer commanding in chief, um, who's running the show from the top. It is fairly specific in its thrust, uh, yet broad enough for some amount of interpretation from each of the individual components. But each of the teams represented a different component, or in the case of the two armies, two halves of the same component with rival nationalities. And most, uh, but not all, of the teams had a hidden component objective as well. This was a secondary task that they had been assigned to just that team um, by a subordinate commander in their own chain. They called for specific things to be accomplished or not accomplished by that specific component on the way to contributing to a joint allied victory in Sicily. On the screen here are the units available to and the component objective for uh, one of the teams representing the U.S. 7th Army. They had to issue orders for all of their units that they believed would fulfill both their component objective and their primary objective. The component objectives were designed to be potentially to, to be mutually contradictory. I, I kept them as hidden information. Um, the team was briefed on its own component objectives, but not on those of anyone else. They represented tasks that individual components might not necessarily want made public in the midst of a complex coalition operation for military and political reasons. Uh, the only information that teams received about others' objectives was what they could discern from their interactions and negotiations with other teams. Um, it sounds like my four-year-old is howling in the background. I do apologize. Um, but uh, again, uh, this is a, a uh, seminar about pandemic war gaming and kids howling in the background is just sort of the milieu that we all, that we all operate in now. Um, so the component objectives were our way of stirring the pot, making sure that the component teams are not one big happy allied family going into the operation. We want them to see how tough it is to both achieve the overall objective and to do what your boss is telling you to do on the side. Now, this was based on an exercise, Joint X was based on an exercise that I designed and ran at several other institutions, um, uh, sometimes at similar scale. It works very well as a teaching tool about the complexities of coalition and joint operations, which is exactly what CFC had wanted. Um, no white cell is required because it's a negotiation game between the allied components. It's not really a tactical war game. Uh, there is no red team and the teams do not actually get to play through their plan. Uh, this is a source of, of constant complaint and dissatisfaction on the part of the players at all of the institutions that I've ever run this at before. Um, but it allows facilitation to be kept at the level uh, at CFC of the directing staff. Uh, so each syndicate um, play or, or twindicate, because we pair them up for this exercise, plays its own self-contained game with no need for outside white cell adjudication. And the directing staff is more than competent to facilitate the discussion that is created by it. So this wasn't a true war game. Um, however, for our sins, we are now redeveloping Joint X into a true opposed war game where the plans they adopt are tested out. Um, I'm calling this Joint X Red just to differentiate it in my mind from the original. I'll be talking about this a little bit later. With uh, Joint X out of the way, we tried our hand at our most ambitious undertaking yet in March of 2021. Uh, this was exercise runtime two. This war game was for the entire Joint Command and Staff Program cohort of 120 students across 12 syndicates playing one single game. It peeled off the layer of cyber rules that I developed for the original runtime and formed a new game entirely around them. With no kinetic effects under the control of the players at all, the 12 syndicates were pitted against one another in an elaborate game of, play of capture the flag using a completely fictionalized world as a free-for-all cyber battle arena. Uh, this supplemented several other course activities relating to cyber operations. The, the most important thing was to get students thinking about the applications and effects generated by cyber capabilities and how they differ from traditional military warfighting capabilities and how they can complement them. As with the previous games, uh, it, was, it was to be played asynchronously, with the only important shared timing points being the order submission deadlines. We had a much more robust white cell for this one, including Lieutenant Colonel Banks, uh, who was seconded back to us from the strategic joint staff to help redesign the rules and run the game. Um, and boy, did we need her. Regular kinetic forces were represented on the map and could be activated under certain conditions, but the only maneuver units that were under player control uh, in this game were cyber forces and special forces. 
both of them were able to penetrate computer networks and try to accomplish goals, but in, in, uh, in different ways. Um, all 12 teams would try to use these assets to gather intelligence, to illuminate enemy networks, to penetrate them through a variety of means, plant and defend against malware, uh, try to get at the key piece of data, in this case, the other team's flags. Because of the complexity of having 12 teams submitting orders, we had them all submit at the same time, but implemented a bidding system for initiative where they had to bid resource points to get a higher initiative placement and then received a bonus against any team that acted after them in the initiative order. This is my Dungeons and Dragons background coming through. I like that, that system a lot and have been working it into other games um, since it adds both structure and attention uh, to uh, determining who goes first. And yes, I named the 12 teams after the 12 colonies in Battlestar Galactica, as I knew that our uh, then director of programs, um, uh, Colonel Barb Honig, was a fan, um, and I am an utterly shameless suck up. I was, however, thoroughly depressed at how few other people playing the game actually got the reference. So this one was really, really, really hard to adjudicate as White Cell. Uh, the directing staff provided the facilitation and the in-game discussions about cyber capabilities with their syndicates, so that was fine. That was, that was perfect. Uh, but they didn't know anything more about the running of the game than the students did. White Cell had to take 12 teams worth of orders, process them, synchronize them, and determine outcomes of conflicts, then get that information turned back around quickly enough to be useful to the teams for determining the actions that they would then take in their next turn. Uh, the game pages, uh, the game rules are less than 10 pages, but there are a lot of moving parts that need to be tracked in this game. We came up with fairly elaborate protocols for trying to do that efficiently in the absence of any form of automation. Uh, we got plenty of extra people allocated to White Cell, but we determined that the problem was that there was a certain bottleneck in the processing of rules where it didn't matter if you had one person doing it or a hundred people doing it, you still needed to go through everything that was happening in detail at about the same pace. The only thing that would dramatically increase the speed of that is some sort of automated system to do it for us, and we didn't have one programmed and didn't have the capabilities at that time. The game was simple for the students to grasp quickly and effectively, but with 12 teams in one game, it had so many moving parts that White Cell was in constant danger of being utterly overwhelmed. Uh, my curriculum development officers and Lieutenant Colonel Banks in particular were absolute heroes. Uh, we determined what the physical and mental limits for White Cells are. Uh, trying to process more than one turn per day was slow, was, was slow motion self-destruction for White Cell. And we had to dial back after one day of that and we just determined that, okay, we've got to shorten the game. There's, there's no way we can, we can keep this up. Um, the, the, the sanity damage, if you will, inflicted on White Cell was, was high enough that we won't be running that again exactly as is. Uh, though the game system is robust. Uh, it was over ambitious, but not a failure. We, we, we felt that the learning objectives for the high level, um, particularly strategic principles of cyber operations were met. Um, this is a game that actually needs more abstraction rather than less. I, I tried to abstract it by taking it out of the real world and giving the countries joke names, but many participants were still hung up on what their countries would really be doing as if it was a foreign policy simulation, which but it was not. Um, if we were to do it again, which we will, uh, what I want to do is get rid of the whole world map and the countries and double down on the capture the flag angle. Uh, that might focus them more on the learning and less on trying to puzzle out what their country is an analog of, what they're supposed to be doing, um, and what was really intended to be be a, a, a free-for-all game. Um, in sum, I'm convinced that the, the cyber war game rules we've developed at CFC are robust, they're fun, and they mirror some of the important processes and effects that you can achieve with cyber, all while remaining in the unclassified realm. Um, I just don't think we've quite nailed the ideal delivery vessel for that experience quite yet. But finally, there is exercise Gossamer 3 which was again executed on the advanced joint warfighting stream at the end of the 2020-21 academic year. Um, for those keeping score, there was an exercise Gossamer 2, but I ran it for a uh, wargaming for PME course that um, I offered for some students in the winter of 2020, and it was effectively a beta test for, for Gossamer 3. Well, I do enjoy designing new games from scratch, which would be fairly obvious from now by now, I was looking forward to using an exercise that we'd already run once successfully and making some adjustments to it. Um, there were more options available for teams this time around to try to defuse situations, to block enemy moves without aggressively confronting them and to otherwise uh, uh, hurt and push them around. The insurgents also had some new tricks they could pull, um, such as uh, the uh, 
Baltic, excuse me, um, such as uh, subverting local Baltic units over to their side. Um, I also did away with the split between the command teams and the field teams, uh, though I've kept that in my back pocket and may use it again. I switched up public opinion on the condition tracks for more universal legitimacy, though mechanically the effect was still the same and the objective was still the same to try to collapse the legitimacy of, um, one, of, the, uh, of, of one of the teams on the opposing sides. Um, I mixed up the teams and what they were doing and wanted to play up the problems of coalition warfare that might be encountered, in part because this was fulfilling uh, that Gossamer 3 was, uh, was replacing a different module in, uh, in the course than the original was. So it was less about targeting this time and more about uh, future warfighting um, and uh, coalition operations. Exercise Gossamer 3 didn't quite have the same spectacular finish uh, that the original did. The Federation side came extremely close once again to collapsing Canadian public legitimacy and, uh, and public opinion. Um, there was a lot more sneaking around, launching attacks from hiding with insurgent forces this time around, a fair number of creative attempts to, to focus fire non-kinetic non actions against the legitimacy of the, uh, of the opposing teams. Uh, lots, of, lots of good fodder for discussions, um, uh, which was exactly what we were looking for. Um, and uh, the, uh, we did this also lack the, the layer of extra cyber rules. Um, we, we took those out as, as being potentially too complicated. So it was back to something that was a little closer to the original uh, Gossamer. Now this game is becoming a mature uh, and increasingly robust part of the curriculum. Uh, the demands upon even a very small white cell were extremely manageable while maintaining a thought-provoking and engaging experience for the students. So Gossamer is my model for how we can start to uh, mature these kind of games into the curriculum. So I want to take us through, um, and th those, are, those are all the games that we have done to date. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of, uh, some of our future plans uh, at the end, but I want to I want to take a step back and offer a few thoughts on some of the, the problematic things that we've noticed over the past 18 months in our experiences with virtual wargaming. Um, some of these are, are pretty specific to CFC. Um, some of them are likely more general to uh, PME institutions as a whole. So adapting to the environment of the new normal was not easy. Uh, it remains an uneven process. Um, this is a photo um, of, uh, of Lieutenant Colonel Scott Jenkinson's office as he and I attempted to execute a, uh, a, a virtual game of, um, of aftershocks uh, with with uh, with one of our classes. Um, this is a uh, it was it, it's it's just perfect in so many ways um, uh, for, uh, for 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 representing this um, because we had to do a lot of improvisation and this the the, uh, the webcam on a box on top of hegemony uh, was kind of the least of it. Uh, while those original statements of needs uh, for the college's virtual wargaming has changed, um, resourcing is, is still something of a problem. Um, and, and honestly, to, to really do what we want to do, we need a, a whole wargaming lab set up complete with custom software. So there might even be money in the budget to accomplish such a thing, but we aren't quite there yet organizationally. Um, one of the persistent problems that I've noted is the struggle against what I, I ungenerously think of as the firehose approach to professional military education. And this is the school of thought that believes that time at Staff College had best be spent attempting to cram as much information into each moment as possible. Um, this is the, the breadth approach to education, and you really can't find a sharper contrast with the traditional graduate school depth approach to education um, that was, was so formative for me. Uh, this one really gets my goat because invariably it seems that the most efficient way to cram material into a course is through lectures, which I am of the opinion, uh, with, with some backing from the pedagogical literature, um, are, are the worst form of education for actually teaching anything. Um, there is a, a persistent inclination towards breadth, and breadth seems to involve getting in as many guest speakers um, to, to talk to people as possible. Um, it's not, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a challenge for wargaming because in order to clear out two, three, four days of white space on the calendar to run these exercises that I've been describing, plus debrief, which is one of the most important parts, you've got to carve uh, quite the bloody swath through the lectures that were there before. Uh, since you can fit two major lectures and associated question and answer periods into that same space for each day. So I, I've had some trouble on this front because wargaming first and foremost takes time that is in short supply at staff college when you're trying to skim over a hundred different topics. Wargaming is a depth approach, really, uh, no matter how you shake it. And that means that it's going to run afoul of uh, the fire hose approach to PME. 
Um, I should note that, that neither CFC nor PME institutions in general are at all unique in experiencing this problem. Um, I understand that many technical colleges and professional training institutions attempt to do the exact same thing. It is a, a time-honored method um, of trying to communicate a, a large amount of information very quickly. Um, and but it, it's, it, it creates some cognitive dissonance for those of us um, who come from different educational backgrounds and uh, um, have, uh, have adopted more of a, a depth approach in our, own, uh, in our own backgrounds. Now, the institutional problem um, that we face is what I refer to as the tyranny of the posting cycle. As in all military positions, the, the people holding them are almost universally only there for a few years. Uh, then they're posted somewhere else and a new face comes in. And this is really good for keeping an organization fresh and preventing it from calcifying. It's a little less good for long range planning across multiple years and multiple posting cycles. Um, I find that, that war gaming is particularly tricky to mesh with the posting cycle. I, I've worked with a few officers, uh, directing staff and curriculum development officers who picked up the games quickly and with enthusiasm. I've had others hit it like a brick wall and bounce off of it with a bad taste left in their mouth from the experience. Um, you can order someone to play a war game from an educational point of view, but when you order them to design war games, when they have no experience in or enthusiasm for this process, you're going to get uneven results. And the problem at CFC is, is uh, kind of a case in point. Our, our main champion for wargaming for some time was my good friend, Scott Jenkinson of the Australian Army, um, who served as, uh, uh, as one of the directing staff at CFC. He's back in Australia now, fighting the good wargaming fight uh, over there. Um, but nobody with his passion and knowledge for this discipline of wargaming replaced him. Um, so it, it makes sense to develop this capability on the civilian faculty side of, uh, of the shop, but that gets into the muddy waters of academic hiring. Um, Reconciling where war games belong within the institutional memory of a war college is a tough one. Uh, we do not we do not do institutional memory very well. I'm, I'm discovering. Um, I've only been here for three years, uh, so this is this is take take these impressions for what they're worth. Uh, but figuring out where wargaming fits within the college so that it can grow and develop is a really hard question, and um, I certainly don't have an answer yet. Now, one of the, the problems that has been noted in the professional and hobby wargaming communities is that for most of its existence, it has been, these hobbies have been dominated by men and almost exclusively by white men. Um, this is a legacy in part of wargaming's roots. Uh, those who have been playing Dungeons and Dragons since they were 12 tend to be rooted in particular demographic groups um, and are overrepresented in both professional and hobby wargaming, uh, if only because they've probably reached that 10,000 hour mark for expertise in this field. And uh, it's dawning on the community that this is a real problem, in part because for wargaming, the decisions that are being made and the analysis that's being done is demographically skewed. So the Derby House principles uh, developed by Professor Rex Brennan at McGill University are a set of principles that are aimed at making sure that wargaming as an activity is not you know, huddled in the corner basking in misogyny and that it is in fact opening and welcoming to everyone. Uh, many organizations have endorsed the Derby House principles. Uh, it's important, the gender-based analysis we baked into um, of what we're doing with, with wargaming, not just because it's right, but because if we don't, wargaming is leaving money on the table when we pursue it as an education educational and, and analytical tool. Um, CFC has not formally endorsed the Derby House Wargaming principles yet, not because we don't believe in them, uh, we do, uh, but because we still don't have a solid fix on what the future of wargaming is at the college. And uh, there was some discussion behind the scenes about exactly, um, exactly what's, uh, what would need to be in place to make a meaningful commitment to those principles. Um, however, from a personal point of view, uh, the war game design class that I'm teaching, um, I am trying to live up to the Derby House principles as much as possible. And one of the design elements that I'm going to insist uh, that each student build into their war game is going to be something based upon a, a gender-based analysis of, um, of their particular topic. Uh, left up to their discretion, of course, but I do want them thinking about uh, some of these non-traditional aspects of, um, of whether it's military history, um, logistics, whatever whatever game they're ultimately going to design, um, I want them thinking about this. And I think that um, if wargaming does find a, um, a, a really entrenched place at Canadian Forces College, that the Derby House principles are going to help us get there um, and are going to uh, enrich the experience for everyone. Now, wargaming is really hot right now, and part of me is worried that it has the characteristics of a fad. 
Um, and if that is where people enthusiastically follow an impulse for a finite period of time, and they, they tend to erupt suddenly onto a scene and then fade away quickly, wargaming has come back around and, and turned into something that is increasing, increasingly fashionable lately. And I suspect it's going to get even more so in future years. Uh, then interest in it will likely fade, at least for a while. Uh, wargaming is subject to bouts of enthusiasm, overprescription, overhyping, and then some degree of disappointment uh, operating on, on cycles like many other things. Um, wargaming, however, has managed to survive multiple iterations of these cycles and, and find regular return and reuse in defense establishments for the past 200 years. Um, this is in part because it, there's something tangible to it. It is an idea that has teeth and has legs. Um, it's not a universal cure-all to every military problem, but even leaving aside its, its analytical research and capability development characteristics, it's invaluable in an educational environment for stressing creative thinking and problem solving outside of traditional graduate student format or graduate seminar formats. However, I'm concerned that unless we have a robust footing for wargaming at the college, that it is going to eventually fade in prominence once its moment passes. Uh, we've seen that with a lot of fads that get picked up by what we refer to as the good idea fairy and parachuted into curriculum. Uh, this is a danger that is exacerbated by the posting cycle and the fact that everyone in the military, on the military side of the shop, is at the college for only a finite amount of time before going off to do something again or doing something something else um, and where, whenever you're placed in a new job you're typically rewarded for creating new initiatives of your own not for following through on the initiatives of your predecessors uh, so i have worries um, but many of them can be solved by developing a robust program while the going is good now um a few notes now on some of our plans for the uh for the future what we've got in the works right now. Um, first of all, the one of the we have a we have a, a series of complementary studies uh, this, uh, courses that are run at um, at uh, Canadian Forces College. I'm running one of them. Uh, uh, Professor Jensen is running a, uh, another one. Um, the, uh, the one that I'm running is on war gaming. It is a, a war game design class, um, and we're uh, going to be. Uh, probably almost wholly virtually delivered. We might be able to get together uh, at least at least for a while, but there's there's still some big question marks about that um, at Canadian Forces College. So probably virtually delivered um, with an emphasis on students designing their own game from scratch. And as I mentioned, I want one of those gender-based analysis uh, uh, components to be included in each of the war games um, in, in some way, shape or form. That will be part of the, uh, part of the assessment for them. How, how much they can kind of look look at, at non-traditional aspects and how they can potentially represent them within a war game that is a challenge that I'm going to uh, I'm going to set for everybody. Um, the uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm really looking forward to and I'm going to be briefing our um, our uh, directing staff on tomorrow morning is uh, what I'm thinking of as joint X red. This is this is actually taking the joint X exercise that I was talking about earlier and giving it a giving it a red team. And the way that we're doing this is that we're taking the students from my complementary studies class, the Wargaming Design course, and we are going to be uh, taking them out of their syndicates, out of their normal, out of their normal, normal groups, and we're going to be using them as a standing red cell and a supplement for uh, supplement for the for the white cell as well. Um, so they will be representing the uh, the Axis forces um, during the uh, during the Battle of Sicily, and this will be run in much the same way as it was before, with the exception exception uh, that it won't end when the plans are submitted. They'll actually get to play out a turn or two of what their invasion of Sicily might have looked like if they were up against a real live opponent. Um, we're still, we're still uh, sorting out a lot of the, the details for exactly what Joint X Red is going to look like, but I'm, I'm optimistic because we, we finally have a good plan for taking this from just being a planning exercise and to a, a real opposed, uh, opposed war game. That uh, makes me very happy. Um, another thing I was I was asked to do this year was uh, to develop a new a new custom war game because I, I haven't done enough of those uh, that um, for to to kind of cap off the uh, the operational planning process, which is really the, the formal staff training part of uh, of the college. Um, this involves a uh, tutorial. It involves a, a a scenario that they're working through and they go through all of the stages of the planning process, or at least many of the stages of the planning process in order to, um, to that is simulating a crisis in these the fictitious
delicious Zoran C. Um, and what they really wanted this year was a week at the end of their of the of the operational planning process uh, to be able to take the results of those plans that they have just spent weeks working on, put them into a war game, and play them out against a red cell, who will also be represented again by uh, my students from my uh, from my uh, war gaming class. Um, they they don't know this yet, but uh, they're 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 in for a bit of a workout over the the course of this academic year. So. This will again involve the entire cohort of uh, of students. Um, I, I don't I don't have a, I don't have a firm plan for exercise Phoenix down yet. Um, I. I got to name it. They probably shouldn't let me name things. Um, all of the exercise, all of the exercises related to the OPP at uh, at the Canadian Forces College are, are Phoenix something. So it was Phoenix Warrior, and then it was Phoenix Flight, and then Phoenix of uh, uh, Phoenix Rising. I think is another one. I called mine Phoenix Down because again, I'm a huge nerd. Um, so the uh, this is this is going to be going on in April, um, and we are um, again uh, quite looking forward to that. Um, and finally, we've got uh, uh, I. I uh, I'm hoping to be able to pare down exercise runtime even further into a kind of a light version of the game that is played a, a little more, a little more lightheartedly, if you will, and just just have it be a capture the flag game between syndicates. Like just throw the idea of you are representing countries entirely out the window. You are you are you are competing in a capture the flag exercise using the same basic principles of cyber operations that we have previously used for the runtime exercises, um, except that it's it's a little more it's a little more fanciful, but is still based upon teaching those uh, those basic those basic principles. I'm I'm really hopeful that the third time with this one is going to be the charm. Um, Rebecca and I were, were discussing uh, this morning that we that it might be a good idea to run this one at the high level, a national security program at uh, at CFC as well. Um, and I think that uh, so we may we may get to, to run this a couple of times. I, I really like those cyber rules that were developed. I'm a big fan of them, and I I, I swear I'm going to find exactly the the correct way to uh, to ultimately put those to work um, for our benefit. And uh, finally, we, we, we have, I, I've been discussing uh, with some people in New Zealand and Australia, the, the idea of um, coming up with some sort of, uh, some sort of game, perhaps between our, our staff colleges, that is much like the, the, ver the, the very good hegemony that, uh, that uh, Rand, has, uh, Rand has put out, um, but for little powers. Um, the hegemony, but for us, you know, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, I don't think are even represented in hegemony. Um, we, we bought it, we bought a copy of it for Canadian Forces College, and it is, uh, um, it's, uh, it's really quite something, but kind of something that captures the, the international dynamic dynamics of how the little guys, if you will, choose their choose their policies, their security and defense policies, um, when we're living next to uh, some of the uh, some of the, the most uh, potent superpowers in the world. Um, I think that there might be something to that. And I think that that could be a real value add. But that, that's sort of a, of a of a stretch goal, if you will, for uh, the state of war gaming in uh, at uh, Canadian Forces College. And we've got a, got a long ways to go before we get there. Um, but uh, that's that's part of the part of where we'd like to, to go is increasing increased collaboration with other professional military education institutes, particularly um, in other countries. So uh, I think that's, uh, I think that's me. I think that's, uh, that's a rundown. Um, I guess that's uh, 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 a little, a little on the short side. Apologize for that, Sebastian. Um, but uh, that is, uh, that is our experience with virtual war games at the Canadian Forces College. Um, the it has been uh, I, it's been an immense privilege um, to uh, to have been involved in this. Uh, the CFC is an amazing amazing organization filled with some of the most hardworking, flexible people that I have ever met. And as I said at the beginning of the uh, of the of the of the talk, the the amount of flexibility that was required and the amount of decisive, bold leadership decisions that were required in a very small amount of time in order to save the program, um, I, I'm still in awe of it. And the, the, the decision to take the course entirely online um, and to, to do that across multiple years was made at a very early stage at CFC when other colleges and other PME institutions were, were still scrambling around trying to figure out what to do. CFC, we were, we were, we jumped right on it. We made the plan, we made this work and it wouldn't have been possible without the, uh, without many of the, the, the decisions that were made by the college leadership um, at the time. And they've, uh, they've, they've embraced a lot of, uh, a lot of these initiatives. So, 
Um, no, I, I, I love I love what I do and, and thank you to Sebastian and to uh, uh, Georgetown to for the uh, uh, for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the, uh, the games that we've been uh, playing along the way here. Hey, Robert, thank you again for uh, your wonderful uh, presentation here. A lot of people have uh, lots of questions, so I'll start uh, going through them. So the first question we got is, when facilitating discussions with many participants at the same time, did a best practice develop or arise that allowed lots of participants to discuss simultaneously? If so, how did you come overcome the whole information overload challenge? Well, in terms of the... Um, a lot of the, the facilitation for these games um, it takes advantage of the fact that at the Forces College, we have a, uh, we already have a system for managing these discussions and, and facilitation. That's just the basic syndicate of uh, 10 to 12 students that is overseen by um, one uh, direct military directing staff member, often with an academic um, attached to them. And this, these groups are, these groups are wonderful. They already all know each other. Um, they're used to carrying out seminars and lectures and other sorts of discussions within within these bodies and they they, they tend to they, they mix them up over the year but they uh, the same basic structure prevails and most of these games take advantage of that structure in one way or another they either use the syndicate or they'll split the syndicate in half and have uh, uh, and, and and have that represented as a team um, and so a lot of the the the, the there are very rare instances um, for facilitation of these games when you're actually having to deal with more than 12 people at a time. It, it's mostly during some of the some of the debrief exercises we'll have a big plenary and in, in which case it's, uh, it's it's a bit it's a bit chaotic. Um, but almost all of uh, what we're what we do with this is uh, is done in those syndicates and is done based upon the syndicate facilitation structure that is already built in to um, to the PME education at, uh, at CFC. So that's one thing that we're able to take advantage of um, and has I I think really enriched the the game is that, that the people who are running the game white cell doesn't need to facilitate the discussions to nearly the extent that we normally would uh, because we the uh, the the directing staff are already on the ground that that's their job that's that's what they're there to do is to make sure that everything that's happening in the war game is then connected to the higher concepts that are uh, that are going on so i would say that that's um, we, we don't have any specific uh, any specific best practices that came out of that, except that we um, except using the existing structures of uh, of the the syndicate groups. So our next question is a bit long winded, but bear with me. At the same time, we at C, uh, CJWC. Uh, we're asked to design a game for a senior CFC course. Same problems with IT limitations for a more difficult problem. It was a dime array of objectives that meant debating interactions with OGDs. Do you think that remote debate focused games are harder to do remotely than operational level or tactical level games? David. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, um, uh, sorry, can you can you uh, can you re read that last that last part of it out to me again? <laughs> <laughs> so, last uh, bit of the question is: Do you think remote debate focused games are harder to execute uh, remotely than operational or tactical level games? Oh boy, um, you know what? I don't. Uh, I think that there are. I think that there are some. I think that there are some. Uh, it, that it's very platform dependent. I found that. Uh, that when I ran the uh, the the, uh, the wargaming for PME course last year at CFC, um, we did a number of negotiation based games like like diplomacy, um, and that was that that worked out really well because the platform that we were using Zoom was uh, extremely was extremely good. Um, we you could create your breakout rooms, you can kind of jump in and out of them, and the 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 students themselves could kind of select whatever room they wanted to go to and, you know, and, and go forth and they could have they breakout rooms with conferences and so forth. And it really, it, it wasn't as good as, as meeting face to face with these sorts of things, but it wasn't bad at all. And we played, a, we played quite a good game of diplomacy and I, I intend to do another one uh, 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 for, uh, for, for my complimentary studies course, um, just kind of as a, as a bit of an icebreaker. Um, we've also did some some you know some matrix war games, which was a bit clunky, but there's a little bit of clunk to the matrix style as it is. Um, I, I think that 
uh, if you've got the right platform and the right tools, then it's made a lot easier. Microsoft Teams is not very good for this, I'm finding. And I'm actually going to have to abandon uh, Microsoft Teams, which is our preferred college instrument for video meetings right now and go back to Zoom because Zoom has the better um, and more flexible and nimble uh, protocols and and uh, structures within its uh, within its uh, breakout rooms. So the ability to replicate those um, the, uh, the 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 face to face experience as much as possible to make it fluid, I think, really determines the quality of the negotiation based games that you're going to be able to play. Um, uh, but I, I think that it, it's perhaps perhaps it is more challenging. Um, but I think that it uh, I, I think that with the right tools, it can it can very very easily and very effectively be done. Uh, for those who will be watching this later and can't see the chat, uh, some acronyms is uh, CA, uh, CASC stands for the Canadian Army Simulation Center and OGD stands for other government departments. So for those who are unfamiliar, like myself, of Canadian acronyms. Um, <laughs> so we're just going to let the Canadians talk among themselves for a while here. <laughs> uh, uh, so I will... Uh, convert a comment uh, into a question is when you you mentioned that you were you had to change some of the names of the countries and the places and the operations uh, to be aligned with some of the protocols and policies of uh, PME war games. My question to you as a designer is, did that affect or have no effect on the players behaviors in the game or um, or what we call like the magic circle or like the immersion element of uh, the game? Uh, you know, I, I ask myself that a lot, and um, I, I think it probably does. I would rather, I would rather just just use just just use the names that that uh, that we mean with this. Um, I made it very clear to the students at the beginning of Gossamer that okay, like for policy reasons, we we can't refer to the enemy um, by the name that's like what we would normally affix to that country on the map. But that's like that's just that's just the way we got to roll with this. I think it does have an effect on the map magic circle, if you will, and the, the suspension of disbelief. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that there's a way around it. If we want to play, if certainly if I want to play, um, if I want to do like virtual war game design at, at CFC, I, I think that that's just like, that's a policy that, that is, uh, uh, that is in place and that we're going to have to dance around to some degree or, uh, or another. Um, and uh, if, if anyone has has suggestions for for for, uh, for a better way to approach that, um, I'm all for it. I, I figured that that calling the bad guys in the Gossamer game the Federation was probably going to be about on as on the nose as I could get while still uh, while still uh, uh, abiding by the terms of the policy. I didn't want to go with Fantasians or anything like that. So I think the best I can do is is something that is within the ballpark and makes it pretty obvious um, what is being talked about without doing the explicit signaling that we have been uh, forbidden from uh, from uh, doing and and with 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 just cause that's a that's a political decision at a at a, at a high level not to engage in that uh, in that signaling and I, I, I 100% respect why why we might not want to engage in that or why we might not why we might not want to let um, some uh, some some crazy assistant professors at our staff college uh, provoke a diplomatic incident over over something like that so it's uh, uh, entirely entirely understandable. So my next question, continuing the theme of Canadian acronyms is, is operational planning process or OPP and intelligence preparation of the battlefield incorporated into any of your war games that you mentioned today? Um, yeah, the, uh, okay, that's, uh, that's a really good one. Um, the, the short answer is uh, no, uh, not yet. The, what we're going to be doing with the exercise Phoenix down is um, we're, we're, that that's, as I, as I mentioned, that is sort of a capstone at the end of um, the OPP. So they can take the plans that they have created and um, put them into a war game and, and, and into an abstraction, of course, in a war game, all war games are abstractions and see, see what, what comes of it. So they actually get the satisfaction of kind of playing a couple of rounds through that at, at the end. Um, as far as as far as OPP in the other uh, in the other ones, there there have been elements of it in the original in 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 Gossamer and the original runtime. In part because when we had when we ran those games initially, it was hot on the heels of the students having completed their for their their OPP modules, and this was um, so they they had just gone through the planning process and with the help of some of the directing staff, 
we, I, I arranged for some of the deliverables that they were creating, the orders that they were submitting um, to basically be, uh, to be, um, to be set up and to be phrased like uh, as if they were, as if they, it basically to couch them in the language of, uh, of OPP. Um, this was at the initiative of some of the very switched on directing staff that we had. It was basically to, uh, to connect what we were doing in the war fighting stream back to OPP. Um, it, it wasn't baked into the rules of the game, but the, the presentation of the orders was, I think, greatly enriched by that, uh, by the inclusion of some OPP elements. Um, it, it's also caused some confusion because uh, when, we, when we did joint text, and I call it a planning exercise, that means different things to different officers. And any of the army officers who have already been through uh, a different staff college at, uh, at an earlier point in their careers, they hear planning and they think OPP. Um, but that wasn't what that wasn't what joint text was supposed to be about. And so they came out, it, it caused some confusion early on because I was using imprecise language um, to describe that. And some of them were approaching joint text as if it was um, a, an operational planning uh, task when, when really it was a, a negotiation and empathy task between the different components. So that was, uh, that, that's, that's had to be significantly clarified uh, as a result because Joint X comes before they do OPP, Phoenix Down and Gossamer uh, come after they do the, uh, the operational planning process. Sorry, my son is hungry again. So I apologize for the uh, gurgling noises over the speaker. No, it's uh, perfectly <laughs> fine here. We like to uh, grab young war gamers uh, while they're still, you know I mean? tentative in their beliefs and careers. Um, <laughs> so the next question is, did you retain notes on the cognitive load slash sanity damage inflicted on the white, da uh, white cell? If so, how did you refresh them between rounds or is there any best practices you wanna share? Oh, um, the, 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 that, was, uh, that was really, the, the best practice there was uh, in, in terms of um, if, with this kind of game where you don't have automated components and you're, you're, you have a, a large amount of information that needs to be processed um, manually every turn um, is basically don't have too many turns per day. <laughs> um, is, is my, my main takeaway was that, um, was that I needed to sacrifice the length of the game um, and some of the, uh, some of the, what I thought was the important part of, uh, you know, give everybody enough turns to really accomplish something. Um, but when we, when we tried to fit in too many turns, it resulted in an absolutely unmanageable workload for white cell because we had to get especially between turn one and turn two we had to get everything done so fast and then turned around and posted and then we had to do the whole thing over again um, but there was a there's a real crunch time there we had to get everything done in about an hour for the information to be usefully turned around and this is partly a matter of the um that we had a very limited synchronous window as we called it at cfc because the the students were spread out across so many time zones that we needed to that there were, I think it was between 11 a.m. and about um, and about uh, uh, 1500. That was the synchronous window that we had to get all all activity in within each day, and it made for a real challenge. Um, and I think after attempting one day of, of processing two turns um, for for runtime two, we just decided nope, we're uh, we we can't do this. It's not it's not even slightly sustainable. Um, so then we went back. We went to a model where we're just doing one turn per day, and um, we would we would stay with the students would submit their orders at the end of the day and white cell could have all night if they wanted to although we didn't um to to finish to finish uh finish doing those uh, uh to finish up processing the orders and posting them back and that that was much more relaxed that was a uh that was that was an order of magnitude easier than trying to cram that whole process into an hour of uh, of time um and it was it wasn't a matter of uh we i had i had the, some of the smartest people i've ever met working with me on that um far smarter than me um, I had a dedicated military professionals uh, at the top of their game, at the top of their careers, and it was still eating us alive. This was, it, was, it was just a bottleneck that could not, uh, that could not be overcome um, short of automation software that we didn't have um, in order to, to, to make it work. And so uh, focusing on delivering, delivering a better product with less time or you know, with, with fewer turns is, uh, I think, was, was the major takeaway for me there. I will never again attempt to uh, run a war game of this nature, of, of the, the games that I've described here, um, that, that had, the process is more than one turn in a day, because it, it's, as I said, it is, it is slow motion self-destruction for white cell. 
So the next question is sort of broad, talking about uh, the Canadian wargaming community. So is there a CAF champion for wargaming? Or can you talk more broadly about the wargaming landscape for Canada, for those who are not familiar? Well, um, uh, there are a number of organizations. Um, uh, the, 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 joint war, the, the Joint Warfare Center, um, who I know have some representatives here today and in the audience, um, is probably, probably, I would probably call them some of the champions of, of war gaming um, in, uh, in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, they, they might disagree. I know it's done in uh, several places. I know that the Defense Research and Development Canada also has a war gaming cell. Um, but uh, we've worked, we've, uh, we've worked close, we've worked with the, uh, uh, with the Joint Warfare Center and we had a bunch of their people come and uh, and help us with the play test um, originally for uh, for exercise gossamer and uh, and runtime back in 2020. Um, and it was it was um, it was uh, Colonel Fred Moore who uh, was uh, he he and I originally um, came up with the idea that uh, eventually became gossamer while we were in Arlington together. So um, I, I feel I feel a lot of uh, affinity with the with the Joint Warfare Center. I think they do um, terrific work there. I, I know that there's there's a lot of uh, Rex Bryan and at uh, McGill um, is is probably the best known name in uh, in, in Canadian war gaming and, and does a, a, a tremendous job. I know Connections North is always a uh, is always very well attended and uh, and, uh, and a big success. Um, I, I wish I was more linked in to the Canadian war gaming scene than I than I am. I, I've been I've been a, a hobby war gamist or war gamer and um, and a gaming enthusiast um, in my own little circles for a very long time. But I, I've come to the academic side of things. Things, uh, for this relatively recently, um, and I'm, I'm something uh, something of an amateur myself. I feel, uh, in uh, I've, I've I've been given a lot of I've been giving a given a lot of space and time to develop this, but um, it has uh, I, I I I don't know the scene as well, the broader community of Canadian wargaming as well as I would like to. Um, in part because over the last eighteen months, uh, my my schedule has been fairly hectic with trying to trying to design and execute these games. But that's one of my objectives for uh, the coming uh, the coming years is to, to get more plugged into that community. So another question is, if Wargaming fits very firmly within the context of the operational operations research, would it also encompass uh, the discipline of defense research and development? Uh, yeah, absolutely. As I, uh, the um, uh, I know that I know that um, Defense Research and Development Canada has its own wargaming um, wargaming cell. I, I don't. I haven't interacted with them as much. I have. I have some friends in DRGC, and I know that we are um, that we've we've been starting to have some discussions about possible joint initiatives that could be put together um, for uh, for for some of wargamings like the that that uh, that middle power hegemony that uh, I was talking about um, is is something that that might be of interest um but it's uh i'm for now i've been i've been much more on the education and training side of wargaming than on the operations um and and uh, an analysis side of wargaming is certainly something that i want to learn a little bit more about because the object the the ultimate objectives are are uh, are very very different the outcomes in the games that i design and put together here are they're not they're not exactly meaningless but they're beside the point what we want is we want the students to be experienced Experiencing, um, experiencing something different. We want them to be entering the magic circle, to suspend their disbelief, to be able to make decisions and see consequences, and to learn from that process, and to um, and to, to think in abstracted ways. And that's that's valuable in and of itself. Um, the side of the wargaming shop that is for, focused more upon outcomes and analysis is extremely valuable. Um, and I'd love to get more plugged in with them. Um, this is uh, uh, and and I I do hope. To in the future. I think Robert just volunteered David Redpath to do his own webinar next spring uh, to expand <laughs> on those things. Uh, and I have my own personal biases that education wargaming is great and we should do more of it in all countries, including Canada. Uh, so the next question is, what are military cyber operators uh, inputting to cyber-focused war, uh, war games development and play? So are you leveraging uh, cyber uh, SMEs or operators into some of your cyber-focused games or do you see that happening oh, in the future? Yes. Um, oh yes, this is uh, 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 Lieutenant Colonel Lauren Banks is um, um, was a cyber operator. 
um, and she was on our JCSP course and uh, and got pulled in to develop the first set of rules for exercise runtime, and then um, was seconded to us from the strategic joint staff in order to uh, in order to look over them. And uh, Colonel Dave Yarker, um, who is one of the the top cyber people in the Canadian uh, Canadian Forces, was um, was also on our national security program last year and happened to be in a class that I was running, and I, I pulled him in too. And between Dave and and Lauren, um, we came up with uh, the, the the three of us really devised that uh, that the rule set for uh, for cyber operations in runtime, and they were quite satisfied that this was at an unclassified level. This was a good representation of some of the major effects, like what what you really need to know about cyber operations and what what can be of benefit to know, and kind of the the dynamic of um, of, of hacking and penetrating and, and network hygiene, um, the idea of connectivity and the the more advanced a piece of technology is, the more vulnerabilities it's probably going to have in it that have not yet been discovered, but that someone else might know. And how to model that within a war game um, in, a, in a way that is still fast and playable and not too cumbersome. Um, I'm, I, it's, it's probably pretty obvious. I'm, I'm really proud of, of the runtime rule set that we came up and I'm, I'm even more proud that we were able to do it with cyber operators um, who are also who are also war gamers um, who, uh, who uh, were integral to the process of developing those rules. Um, so now that we have those rules, I want to keep I want to keep uh, running them by cyber operators um, in order to make sure that you know it still represents the, the most up to date information. Um, but and now that we have them, I'm quite confident that we can we can run a pared down version of what I've been talking about with runtime um, for students to as, a, as an introduction to some of the basic concepts, because one of the things we struggle with at CFC uh, is to be able to make cyber thinkable to um, most of our students who are the, they're they're in logistics, they're in the combat arms, um, they they they, you know, they, they haven't they haven't encountered the intangibles of cyber warfare in quite the same way. And it can sometimes be a struggle to connect that to the other aspects of, 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 of operations that are going on. So that was that was why that that's why I'm 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 particularly pleased about runtime. And I'm absolutely uh, bloody nose determined to uh, make sure that it gets the it gets the vessel uh, to to best communicate um, those principles that that I think it deserves. So the next question is, how do you balance the learning curve for the students and the workloads for the white teams when you design games? Well, the, huh, um, the that's uh, that's a uh, that's a really good question. Um, that's a learning process for me in terms of what what you can expect of the students, and I, I've, I've kind of got my ranging shots on that. I think that the um, the first. I can't remember exactly how long the first um, exercise Gossamer and, and runtime rule books were, but they're probably in the range of like 30 pages or so. And um, by the time we got down to exercise runtime two, I, I pared them down to about 10 pages of, of, of actual rules. Um, so there is there is a learning curve. The fact that they're, these are all team games, and that's really the only way to play these mass war games. You gotta put them in teams. Um, that is, I think, uh, I think the, the 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 critical element of it is that on any team of you know, somewhere between six and a, and a dozen people, you're going to get some people who understand it better than others, and they're uh, the 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 learning curve is helped along when they are able to help one another, when they're able to bounce ideas off, when they're able to approach members of White Cell to ask for rules clarification. So I try to keep an open door policy when the game is actually being played, so that anyone can can come and and shoot a question and get that answered as as quickly as possible. And we've got some pretty good mechanisms for uh, doing requests for information, RFIs and passing information and making sure that it, it circulates as quickly as possible. I have not had, um, and maybe my students would, would, would disagree, but I have never had the impression that with any of these games that I've described that the learning curve has been excessive, um, that, too much is being, that too much is being asked of them. A lot of them kind of uh, roll their eyes or, or there, there, there are a number of, uh, <laughs> there are a number of, of uh, very funny uh, cartoons in the student newspaper about me um, proclaiming how simple this was uh, in, uh, that, were, that were circulated. So there, there probably is some disagreement there, but um, in terms of the results, 
uh, the like the, the the quality of the orders that were submitted, the um, the number of errors that were, were creeping into it, it the, the understanding was picked up pretty fast. So it, it, in part, it's intuitive. It, it's it's a matter of like what how, how much is how much is too much? How much uh, how, how many moving parts does this game have? How many things do students have to keep track of? I try to I try to kind of build my own um, my own flow chart or spreadsheet of these things uh, in advance in order to um, in order to get a sense of well what is uh, like what how much time is going to have to be devoted to each of these activities um, and how much is, is ultimately going to going to be too much and how much is this based upon other war games or other things we've already done that they can kind of grab onto and use some of those concepts and 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 be grounded in them um, I found that the building on previous war games whether it is uh, 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 runtime building on the original scenario for Gossamer, or um, then again the, uh, the the second iteration of of Gossamer using a lot of the same rules as um, as as runtime. There was a lot of familiarity for when when they do the, the war gaming the second time around. So the there, there's a bit of a, a bit of a learning curve at first, but I find. Um, that by using similar rules, by using lots of touchstones um, between these exercises, that it's it's really quite manageable. The students uh, very rarely submit orders that um, suggest to me that they have absolutely no idea what they're doing, that they're that they're they're lost. Um, I, I try to address that quickly if it happens, but it's uh, vanishingly uncommon um, for uh, for what I've experienced with these games so far. So it's. Uh, yeah, it's it's really it's a really difficult problem uh, to try to manage that learning curve and to try to make sure that uh, that it stays playable and fast and fun, um, while at the same time not not being too much and and just as just as importantly not not burning out white cell. Um, burning out white cell is that that's that's my new focus. I will I will let you know as soon as I have some best practices for how not to do that. Um, but uh, it's 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 slowly coming along. So to continue the theme of uh, Canadian acronyms, is there any plans for evolving intelligence in these exercises or pouring them over for or over to CFSMI, which stands for apparently Canadian Forces School of Military Intelligence? Well, uh, really good question. Um, I am I, I I haven't done a lot of work with intelligence thus far um, in these war games. Um, that's going to change with Joint Tax Red. There are there is an intelligence uh, element to it. It is uh, for for Operation Husky. Um, the planning exercise that uh, that we're doing is now going to become an opposed game. Part of the game is going to be um, deception on the uh, on the on the Allied side to try to uh, try to prevent the axis from from figuring out where exactly on the island they're going to be landing um, which is sort of a, a basic intelligence problem and I've got some I've got some mechanisms to try to simulate that and to to make it to, to make it interesting and fun um, and to, to build in that element of uncertainty about well you know well where, where the hell are they coming ashore what are, how are we how what is our response going to be um, and if you guess wrong then the entire thing could fall apart so that that kind of dynamic of, of hidden information and intelligence gathering um, I want to learn how to model that better and I think they're working with some of the existing intelligence uh, establishments within the CAF would be a really good way to do that um, I have uh, I, I believe we've had some intelligence officers who have had uh, at least who, who, have, who have played the game and offered some input and um, some value I, I got some really good tips on debriefing techniques I believe um, uh, from uh, from an intelligence officer who was taking um, our course early on um, so it's been it's been folded on but that, that is an area where I think we could stand to use some, uh, stand to improve and, uh, and explore some more dynamics. So this is a question uh, for you, Robert, in the sense of what advice would you give for other PME instructors who want to incorporate more wargaming into their curriculum or into their class? Uh, what are some hard lessons learned you, you've garnered in your own experience and what would you give in terms of design? Uh, tips well hmm. um I, I think a, a lot of a, a lot of that a lot of uh, a lot of my best tips i think if i i went through in the in the presentation um the it, it really depends on on your needs and what i'm talking about here is 
is virtual war games very specifically um, because uh, this is this is a niche that um, that, that personally I'm, I'm very I'm very comfortable operating in um, and uh, I, I don't even live in the same city as the, as our staff college so I mean the the commute uh, from uh, the commute to my office is extremely short for me and I've I've really uh, I've, I've really enjoyed setting up these virtual experiences that we can have regardless of whether or not the provincial health authorities are um, are allowing students to be back at the college or not. This is this is something that that is is really important to me. And um, the the pandemic really helped to 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 this this particular niche of virtual war games to grow into uh, to, to to grow and, and blossom, if you will, um, at CFC. It, it probably wouldn't have otherwise, because traditionally the the distance learning parts of the program um, have not been uh, have not been as robust as the residential parts of uh, of the program. Um, I, I don't have. I don't know if I have general advice on war game design. I think that uh, it, it's really a matter of of knowing your audience and um, if you're and, and and having a really good sense of what the needs are. Um, as I said early on, CFC never put out a statement of needs for for war gaming. They 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 let me have. They let me do. They let me design it because I was I was willing to try to put something new together on short notice um, for one of their classes, and and they ultimately liked the result of it. Um, my, my advice would be to um, to uh, reach out and, and and see what can be done, um, and try to find try to find uh, elements of the course that are perhaps somewhat outdated in their approach. Um, I use threaded discussions as uh, as an example repeatedly because I. I Again, Rebecca and I were just talking this morning about how terrible they are. Um, how they're 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 a little bit soul destroying in comparison to a properly run residential program. And being able to strip out uh, threaded discussions from a um, from from one of our, our virtual courses and replace it with a war game is like one of the great delights of my life um, because it is it's just a, a much better experience I believe for for everybody involved in uh, in the process. Um, the I, I I don't I I I don't have any more specific uh, specific advice. I, I'd have to have uh, more specific questions um, uh, asked of me than that. But I hope that some of what you heard in uh, in the presentation was uh, was useful for at least in terms of framing um, how how uh, how we've adapted virtual war games for uh, for CFC. So to end our great webinar tonight with a question that I always ask one of our speakers that uh, this year, whenever I'm running or moderating uh, one of these sessions is if you had no constraints on funding or institutional barriers, if the, you know, in the Red Sea proverbially opened up to you, what game would you want designed uh, for, for you or your class? Or what game would you want to design yourself? Well, um, the if 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 funding wasn't an issue, um, that that whole idea of a war games lab at CFC where we could um, where we could have like a recording studio, a, a webcam studio, so for actually you know for 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 tabletop games, um, the the that that kind of uh, space to to create automate software that could automate some of these problems and get by past some of these bottlenecks that I've discussed would be extremely helpful. Um, the game that I would really like to, to, to see made is that collaborative game um, that, that takes a look at foreign policy and, and defense policy um, between some of the, you know, the second tier powers, Canada, Australia, um, and, uh, and, and, and others um, who, are, who are not the big players on the international scene and have a very different set of Priorities, national defense issues that they have to that they have to work across um, than than the superpower um, uh, United States does or, or China or any of the others. And I'd really like to be able to make a game that is collaborative between the different staff colleges and actually get the staff colleges in you know the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand um, in particular. You know, if you want to make a make a big old five eyes thing out of it, um, we could. I, I'd really like to see. Um, some kind of war game involving all of the all of the uh, the, the 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 staff colleges, um, so that we can uh, kind of you know walk a mile in each other's shoes, um, get to learn to know some of our our colleagues across the across the oceans, um, and see see what's different, see what's uh, see what's what's very uh, familiar and very um, and very similar, and uh, put together a game that would be able to really capture the dynamics of those uh, of the of the of the little of the little powers um, of the world 
um, and in particularly, uh, particular, well, particularly the country that's that I'm in and that uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, we have uh, such rich partnerships with. So that that would be the game that I would really I'd really like to to see. So sort of like sort of like hegemony, but at a uh, aimed at aimed at different countries. So on that note, um, I love the idea of hegemony for little powers, or I guess other powers. Um, I think you should definitely pursue that. And if you ever have uh, get to run that game for the different command staff colleges, I'll definitely try to loop in uh, the Marine Corps Command Staff College because I know there's a lot of interest in doing a lot more PME wargaming there. So thank you everyone for attending uh, the webinar and thank you again to our speaker uh, for sharing his insights and, uh, and uh, wisdom into his own experience at running games for PME. And I hope you guys have a good night.